Hello. This is part 2 to my build mode series where I will be showing you how to make a tool system slash remove tool and a couple of other things. Before we get into that though, one of my viewers found a bug with the last video. If you place a block under the base plate, it knocklips through the base plate. Let's fix that really quick. Open up the block placer local script. The reason this is caused is because we elevated the positions y variable by adding that extra plus 1. Let's test out how the script currently works. As you can see, the block is going through the base plate. This is a simple fix, but it helps a lot that this viewer reported this bug. If you guys find any other bugs with either this tutorial series or my concept game, please let me know. We can solve this by getting rid of that plus one. But now we need to use a different approach to make sure that the block doesn't go through the base plate when you place on top of it. We can offset the block depending on which surface it is on by using vector dot from normal ID and inputting the mouse's target surface. We can add this newly formed vector to our current mouse hit position variable. If you weren't aware, vector dot from normal ID receives a surface, top, left, front, etc., and converts it into a vector 3 unit. For example, top becomes 0, 1, 0, bottom becomes 0, dash 1, 0, right becomes 1, 0, 0, etc. But as you can see, you can place a block in the position that you want, no matter the target surface. Now before we continue, I want to go to players in Explorer and turn down the respawn time to 2 seconds. That way, if you fall off the map, you won't need to wait 5 whole seconds to respawn. Let's work on our GUI now. I'm not going to show you how to make an accurate piggy build mode GUI because that would take quite a long time. I also want you to use some creative liberty and either try to remake the piggy build mode GUI or create your own. This frame that I created will hold the tool buttons that you could click to select a tool. Add a text button and a UI grid layout into this frame. The UI grid layout helps with formatting and the general layout of the buttons. To change the size of the buttons, go on the UI grid layout properties and adjust the cell size to your liking. It's useful to know the difference of when to use scale versus offset. Offset uses pixels, while scale is proportional to the element's parent. If you're unsure which one to use, I'd recommend scale since it's easier to use, but if you want to recreate the official GUI, you'll have to use offset and anchor points, and a little bit of scripting. Anyways, let's actually customize the buttons now. Again, how you want to customize it is all up to you. The only thing that matters here is that the layout order is set to whichever number tool you want it to be. For example, if you want the build tool to have the number 1 and the remove tool to have number 2, make the build buttons layout order 1 and the remove buttons layout order 2. Other than that, nothing else really matters. You could name the buttons however you want or change the text to whatever you want. Let's create a local script in the GUI. You could name it whatever, but I'm going to name it build local. This is where we will handle the buttons. We will also work with more UI elements in this script later in the series. First, let's add two variables, a replicated storage variable, and a screen GUI variable. Now, let's loop through all of the buttons in the frame. This way, we can track each individual button to receive a signal when it gets clicked. Let's make sure that it is a text button, or image button, depending on how you made your GUI. This way, the script won't be shoot an error when we try to receive a signal when the UI grid layout gets pressed. The reason we have to worry about this is because the for loop goes through every child to the tool frame. Before we continue the rest of the script, add a folder into replicated storage named values, this is where we will store different values, starting with the tool. In this folder, add an int value and name it tool. The difference between an int value and a number value is that int values cannot be decimals. Hence the name integer value. Now, back to the script. When a tool button is pressed, set the int values value to be the button's layout order. Now, navigate back to the block placer script. Here, we are going to set certain conditions so that you can place blocks when the tool value is 1, and remove blocks when the value is 2. First, create a function and put the placing, creation and surface selection from our last video inside of it. Then, create a part variable so we can access the block outside of the function. Then, set the part variable inside the function. Also, replace any instance of placing outside the function with part. Then, replace surface select with part.surface selection. Now, let's create a variable for the tool value in replicated storage. Now that we have that variable, create a function that runs whenever the tool's value is changed to something else. We receive the new tool value with that function. I'm naming that variable number. Now, in this function, if the new value is 1, it will create a block to move around, but otherwise, that unplaced block will be destroyed. Let's do the same to the mouse release function. This way, if the tool is 1, then the block places, but if it's 2, the block gets destroyed. But, what if we want to filter the target based on conditions? For example, I only want the mouse target to be acknowledged if it is parented to the placed blocks folder in workspace. We can accomplish this by creating a separate object value inside the block placer script. Then, let's create a variable for it. The reason why we have this value is because we're going to constantly check to see if the mouse target meets certain conditions and if it does, we will set the object value's value to it. Let's put everything in the current render stepped function into a conditional statement based on the tool value. 
To see if the mouse target meets the requirements, let's set a boolean variable named valid. It will be false by default, but if the mouse target works under our conditions, it will become true. Once we run those tests, if the variable is true, then we set the target value to it. Rather than checking to see if the tool value is 2 when we run this function, let's just check to see if it's above 1 so it would be easier to implement other tools later. Here, the two conditions we are checking for is to see if the tool is 2 and the target belongs to the placed blocks folder. We check to see if the tool is 2 because if it was paint or pick, the mouse target didn't have to be only inside the placed blocks folder, it could also be the base plate. Now, if the conditions returned as true, we set the target value to the mouse target. We're also going to add a red box around it to emphasize that it's targeted and will be deleted if the mouse is clicked. Add a folder into replicated storage called extras. This is where we will put the selection box. Let's duplicate the placed block into the workspace to find the right properties for the selection box. Insert a selection box into the block. Make sure to set the Adorni to the block to test. You can customize it however you want, but I'm going to make the lines red and thinner than they are now. Once you're finished customizing the selection box, you can remove the Adorni and put the selection box into the extras folder. You can also delete the block. Now, let's get back to scripting. Let's refer to the selection box we just created. We will clone it, parent it to the part, then adorn it to the part. But, let's say the mouse target does not meet the requirements that we set. In this case, we will nullify the target value, or in other words, set it to nothing. Now, let's create a function for whenever the target value is changed. We receive the new object value as a variable, which I'm naming, value. For now, all that this function will do is print the target's name, just for testing, but we will actually make it do something later. As you can see, when we set the tool to 2 and hover over a part, it will print, placed blocks. This is actually a mistake that we'll fix in a second, but other than that, once we stop hovering over any part and hover over the base plate or sky instead, it prints, nil. This is an easy fix, just set the target value to the mouse target rather than the mouse target's parent, I don't know why I made that mistake lol. Now, when we try again, the selection box will appear when we hover over a block, but the problem is that it doesn't disappear when you stop hovering. This is where the target.changed function comes handy. Instead of printing the target's name, we're going to remove the previous target selection box. We can do this by having a variable named prev target. We will store the previous target here whenever the target value gets changed. Here, when the target value is getting changed in the render step function, we can use task.wait and then set the prev target variable to the new target value. If we keep the parentheses empty, it will wait around 0.02 seconds. The reason we need to have this tiny delay is to make sure that when referring to the prev target variable in the target changed function, we don't accidentally recall the new target value. When the target value is changed, we can retrieve the previous target, find a selection box in it, and then destroy that selection box. As you can see, it works just as expected. But now, let's make it so that if you click, it will actually get deleted. On the block placer, when the mouse button is released, we're going to fire a remote event. Create a new event in the build events folder called remove block. Like I mentioned last time, the reason we can't just destroy the block from the client side is that it will only get destroyed for the player who clicked, but it will still be there for everybody else. When we fire the server, let's pass on the target value as an argument. Now, let's go on the build handler script and receive the remove blocks event signal. The function will be very simple, we're just going to destroy the part. It works perfectly. For the last part of this video, we're going to make this tool system compatible with the keyboard. For example, if I type 1 on my keyboard, the tool will become build, while if I type 2, it will become delete. We're going to start by retrieving the user input service by a variable. Now, let's create a function whenever an input begins. This could be any input, such as pressing a key or clicking the mouse. We receive this input, as well as whether the input is processed by the game or not. If it is processed, that means the player's inputs are being acted upon by the game. For example, if the player is chatting, processed will return as true. We want to make sure that it isn't processed so that the tool doesn't change while the player is chatting or something. But anyways, let's create a table with the key codes that we want to be acknowledged. So far, it's only 1 and 2, but we will add 3 and 4 eventually. We want to see if the input key code is in this table. If so, we will change the tool value to the index it is in in the table. I actually made a mistake on this part. Where it says input.name, it should say input.keycode.name. It works. On my keyboard, I am pressing 1 and 2 and the tool is alternating between building and deleting. Anyways, that was it for today. 
Thank you so much for watching, and like I said, if you find any bugs with either this tutorial series or my concept game, please let me know. Bye.